Pale and meshes. Nowadays everyone knows where is best legendary weapons in Baldur's Gate 3. But I found more than 15 weapons that a lot of players probably missing when they play in this game. Just look at this common scimitar with 20 bonus damage per hit. Let's start with the first training level. So right at the start of the game you can already achieve this awesome sword. 2d6 plus your strength modifier and additional 1d4 fire damage. With cleave actions that will give you ability to cleave multiple enemies at once, plus a rage that will make enemies bleed, and pummel strike so you can use a bonus action to do additional damage. Very strong blade. And big and scary. This is, I guess, is most well known blade from the list of today's weapons. So, to get this uh, blade, basically, you need to play as cleric or don't forget to switch Shadow Heart spell at this uh, tutorial level. So, you use common spell as cleric, every cleric got this spell, and you need to use common drop. And if you succeed this common drop on Commander Shulk, he will drop his weapon and you can just go pick up it and then equip. He will be useless boy with his fists and you will be wielder of this incredibly powerful blade. This sword is insanely good for early game. Best classes will be Barbarian, Fighter and Paladin. Paladin will have really strong smites with this and Fighter and Barbarian is basically a really high damage melee classes. The only problem a Barbarian blade got that there is no enchantment, so we don't have this plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 bonus to attack damage and attack rolls. So in late game it will be harder to hit with this blade than with other good weapons. And another problem, it's not dippable, so you can't use elixirs, potions on it, so it will be poisoned or with other characteristics. So next weapon will be in Emerald Grove, in Druid Grove. And you probably missed this weapon, but this weapon is actually insane. It's lying just over here. So this is like first place where you can find it, and it's not other weapons than practice sword. Sadly, we will need to be sneaky to get it because it will be stealing action. But why is it worse to get practice sword? So coolest part about this practice sword, it's doing blood joining damage. And if you play in someone like Rogue that need to, to do sneaky attacks with his dagger, with most of the weapons you will get piercing or slashing damage. But when you fight in someone like constructs, golems, robots and other guys, you will need blood joining damage. And blood joining damage is from hammers, maces, morning stars and other stuff like that. So practice sword is the only weapon that can use sneak attack and do blood joining damage instead and attack with advantage to make incredible blood joining damage from sneak attack. And next weapon can be found randomly in Widon crates just nearby and of course it's salami. Yeah, it's not only camp supplies but also a club with 1d4 damage plus your strength modifier. It's light so you can double wield it in two hands. Also you can dip salami into fire and it will do additional fire damage. So never skip on this furious weapon if you want to have some fun in Baldur's Gate 3. And to get our next weapon we need to go to goblin camp. So next weapon is a maze and it will be useful for basically any class. Any class that will at least some time attack with this maze. You can use it on barbarian, on fighter, on cleric or even on dual wield champions. So if your character using dual wield feet you can <laughs> use this maze with another maze or other like sword and do incredible amounts of damage. But most of players missing it. So when you enter in Goblin Camp, Shattered Sanctum, you need to turn right on these stairs. Go up and there's a Mr. Abdirak. So most of the players using him as permanent buff if you succeed a lot of checks. But if you continue your storyline and do all quests, uh, he will basically leave Goblin Camp and you will never see him again. That's why it's a nice idea to just sneak behind him and just zap one time. So what is on him? The only Lovator's Scourge, Abderax Maze. This maze is doing 1d6 damage plus your strength modifier. And additionally it's doing 1d6 damage to all nearby targets, including you. But it gives you resistance to necrotic damage, so you will get only half damage from this 
In early games, there are a lot of mobs who will climb up in the pretty low health. So just one strike and everyone nearby taking large amount of damage, so it's just a few hits away from dying. So this maze is really nice for early game. Before you enter to Act 2, there will be a lot of enemies with this resistance to necrotic damage. How many of these weapons do you knew existed? Write in the comments after you watch full video. And right now let's get back to the next weapon. Next weapon locates in Arcane Tower in Underdark. So you need to gain access to this elevator and go to the upper floor. Depending on your conversation with Bernard, it can go either way, you can be friendly or hostile with him. Anyway, you will gain access to this top room. But there's a really high chance that you will miss this stool. So what is it? If you just hover mouse over it, it will be stool of heal giant strength. Looking pretty basic, but if you just go attack it and destroy it, you will find club of heal giant strength. So it's piece of this stool. So what is this stuff? This club doesn't have really impressive damage, only 1d4, but it will raise your strength up to 19. So after you equip it on mage, or for example cleric, this cleric will get 19 strength, will instantly improve his carry capacity, and also will have higher chance to hit and do more damage with this stick. Additionally, you can completely dump your strength and get other attributes. So try not to miss this stick, it's really powerful. Next item will appear when you go to this underdark trigger boat, when you're going on Ibn Lake, on your road to Green Forge. And while you're adventuring, there will be another boat coming nearby. Most of players will like to try to use athletics to push Durger into water, but it's better to use deception on this Corsair Greymon. You want him alive, or if it's not possible, try not to push him off the boat. Because this little buddy got a really nice item on him. If you manage to not engage in a fight on the boats, he can sell it to you. But if you're fighting with him, you just can't take this out. Jorgoral Great Sword. Looking pretty basic, 2 to 6 plus your strength. But there's a reason why this item is on the list. Don't forget, every weapon got not only base stats, but also additional attacks. It gives you this awesome attack, Colossal Onslaught. And this will do 1d10 plus your strength and additional piercing damage. But coolest part, it will not do it to one target, but to multiple targets in a line, in a really big line. So if you got a lot of strength, it will do really nice damage. And coolest part, this attack will stack with Great Weapon Master All-In. So even in early levels, you can do already almost 30 damage to a lot of targets while having at least plus 18 flat damage to all of them. And range is really incredible, look at this range. Additionally, this sword got cleave action, that's very nice action too, so you can cleave enemies nearby. And basically by using your action surge, you can do it in one turn and do really incredible damage. So don't skip on this sword in early game. Next weapon is Shining Stavers of Skulls. It's light hammer, light and thrown weapon. Coolest part, it got 1d4 additional radiant damage. So already pretty nice damage for early game item. But also this weapon shines light. So you will light area in front of you, light targets in front of you. Not too overpowered, but really nice weapon in early game. And this weapon is on the same trigger. While all previous weapons was really easy to encounter on your journey, but you can miss them. Next weapon is really cheeky. And it's really easy to miss this weapon because there's a lot of places in Underdark. But here, on near this uh, torch stalk field, with these mushrooms where you can go in, go out of the Underdark, a lot of craged rocks, maybe there will be a bullet fight over here. Most of the time you just continue your path down the road, to Arcane Tower, or to this beach, whatever. But you need to look behind, over here, so instead of going to Arcane Tower, which is like here, we're going backwards, and we need to jump on these mushrooms. So now we can reach awesome place with a caged rock, and and we are in no other place but Festering Cove. 
Here is a lot of Kua Toa, little fish boys, which is balls faithful, and they get chance to apply bleeding to targets. And you will see this uh, bull drip the Zelos. Let's talk with him. And if we succeed on dialogues like that, we can be Ball's chosen finally. And Ball will give us his blade. Pretty basic weapon, but it's doing 2d4 instead of basic 1d4 from other sickles. It got action lacerate, which can make your targets bleed. In this zone won't kill these fish guys, you will get this ball's blessing when using this sickle. And get advantage on attack rolls against bleeding creatures. So I would say it's really nice weapon for someone like Rogue. So you get free advantage on bleeding targets and you will be able to use sneak attack every turn. So I guess it's pretty nice secret and really interesting location with funny weapon. That definitely can be used in early game as our previous weapons. But if you go to the left side of Selenite Outpost, right over here, you will see a lot of petrified draws. I guess a lot of players was in this encounter. When you try to attack them, you can engage in a battle. And after fight, after you win this fight, you will find this draw named Dorn. With pretty interesting amulet and of course quest item, memory shard. Other loot is looking like pretty basic, but this icy health is really important. And I guess many players can miss this icy health. Just double click it and you will see combined items menu. So we need to find two icy parts and you will get them from the quests in this area. I already shown on screen where to get all parts. And when you combine all parts, you will get this item. And this item is incredible. It's working not only in the early game, but you can use it throughout the game. Morning Frost, really incredible stuff. Especially if you're going for someone like Frost Mage. I got built for this type of mage on my channel, but basically you can go for Wizard or Sorcerer, make sure to somehow get Create or Destroy Water, you can get it with uh, Storm Sorcery Sorcerer, or just by getting one level in Cleric. So your idea is to just uh, throw some water on enemies and then use icy spells on them. They will be encrusted in frost and just be destroyed to ashes. Because the stuff that you can find on basically first levels of the game will deal additional cold damage whenever you're doing cold damage. Additionally, it can inflict shield state on target. And this means the entity will be vulnerable to cold damage. So just spells like Cone of Cold can do 150 damage in a turn. Very nice stuff. Especially considering only thing you need is this stuff. But if you manage to throw water on your targets and make them wet, wet plus chill condition will make them icy status. And then this icy status can be destroyed to ashes like that. Next one can be found in Underdark Grimforge. This quest can go into a lot of different directions, but this guy, Elder Britvor, got very nice pike on his back. Dwarf pike, of course, so we're taking it. It looks like a very ordinary pike, so it's really easy to just miss this item. But look on this extra action. Dig deep. Deep Delver will inflict Shattered on hit, and you deal additional 1d4 piercing damage against Shattered targets. So while it's not having more damage than ever burn blade, you still can dip this weapon into fire. And now as one-handed weapon it will do really nice damage. And as you can see it's pretty unique condition. So Shattered is only given additional damage when struck by the war peak Deep Delver. So only this peak got this extra future in the game. But again damage for really one-handed weapon in early game is pretty nice. Alright, let's get a little bit back. If you're not going into Underdark, but going into Mountain Pass instead, you will find Trader Lady Esther. And by this point you already should have nice gear and nice weapons. So you probably will just skip this war pick. Another war pick, yeah. But don't rush. So copy. It's basic war pick with 1d8 damage. Again, 1d8 is really nice damage. It's one-handed, so you can have shield in another hand or another war pick. But what makes Hoppy is really great weapon? Again, her additional spell or skill, whatever. You will get this ability to strike a foe with 1d8 plus 10 piercing damage. I guess it can scale with my strength, so right now my strength is giving me plus 6 damage. 
plus 5 damage and plus 1 from enchantment. So maybe the skill will add uh, something like plus 3, plus 4 damage. But still, you smash into 4, wounding them and healing your own injuries. Basically, you're doing additional 4 necrotic damage while healing 1d6 hit points to yourself. And here, yeah, you're dealing additional necrotic damage equal to your proficiency bonus. So on these levels in early game, probably it will be like 3 damage. And cool part, of course, to combine it with some additional gear. You can find Kaga's amulet, which is named Broadmother's Revenge. And when you are healed, your weapon becomes encoded in magic and deals additional 1d6 damage. So by using dual wield strategy and using copy with this skill, you can go in into the fight, heal yourself, do additional damage and then coat your weapons in toxic poison. It will look something like this. So you just attack enemy, you heal yourself and your Hopi will be dipped in poison and start doing additional 1d6 damage. Really nice stuff. And again, it's really easy to skip on this basic pike or pick, sorry. Next one is beautiful hammer. And actually you can find it a lot more earlier than under dark and mountain pass. I just forgot about it, but it's very cool. It's easy to miss because you need to investigate area throughout, but it's really great hammer. First of all, it's two-handed and it's doing 2 to 6 damage plus your strength modifier. But every time you jump, you're dealing 1 to 4 damage. When you miss an attack, you're dealing your strength modifier anyway. In early game, you will miss a lot of attacks and while you're missing, you will do damage anyway. That's nice. Additionally, in early game, you will have low movement speed. So it's always a nice idea to jump in early game. And when you're jumping, you're doing additional damage in radius. And this damage is thunder damage, so it does damage type. A lot of people can be vulnerable to this damage. So it's really fun hammer in early game. Saddest part, like other weapons that you acquire in early game, it got no enchantment, so it's harder to hit. But don't forget, to do this thunder damage, you need to activate this passive ability shockwave. And upon activation, it will start to work. So you just need to jump and do this extra damage to nearby targets. Then probably miss and use tenacity to do additional damage. So really fun stuff to do. And finally, we're going to items from Act 2. So as you can see, there's a lot of items in first act that you probably missed, but in Act 2, there's nonetheless. I like some weird looking items. And this weapon is not exception. So look at this lighting jabber. It's easy to miss because you need to go to the far corner of the map to be ambushed by these guys with scrap spears. This is thrown versatile weapon with enchantment of plus one. So really nice enchantment for second act. But every attack is doing 1d4 lighting damage and on hit possibly inflict shock, which will remove ability from targets to use reaction. But most importantly, you get throwing action lighting damage. So when launched at target, deal additional 1d4 damage. And to have fun with this lighting jabber, I recommend picking Someone like Eldritch Knight, so you can uh, stick with this weapon and throw at your targets. This weapon will get back to your hands while doing really insane throwing damage. Also, don't skip the Tavern Brawler feat, so you'll do even more damage while throwing items and also have high hit chance. But also, I like to have two Lightning Jabbers in my hands by getting Dual Wielder feat, so you can look like crazy crap guy make your character red and have fun with this dual wielding jabber build. Animations is really funny too, attacking with jabbers is always really fun. But throwing for extra damage is very useful and can be really powerful. So don't skip on this weapon. Next weapon is really easy to miss because you need a lot of circumstances to get it. You need to investigate Moonrise Towers by also having Gale in your party. And by doing some magic in combination, you can get this Shadow Lantern. And at first, it can be looked like just basic Shadow Lantern used as a light source. But it also given you awesome spell, Conjure Shadow Lantern Breath, level 6 Necromancy spell. So already you will get access to this level 6 spells and you can make this awesome shadow as your companion. And as you already probably know, Shadow got a lot of resistances to a lot of damage types, but not Radiant. And also it got ability to have Shadow Blend, so when you are lightly or heavily obscured, you will blend and be invincible. But it have hard time 
fighting in sunlight. Still, damage for summon at these levels is really impressive. 2d8 plus 3 plus 2d4 necrotic. Or you can drain strength from your foes with 3d8 necrotic damage and also leech strength by 3. Just make sure not to fight in the light areas. And Shadow will be nice friend that do a lot of damage. To get this hammer again, you need to investigate area throughout. And then you will find guy who and you will need to take it out from him. What's so cool about this hammer? First of all, nice damage. 2d6 plus your strength, plus 1d4 thunder damage every time. And it got plus 2 enchantment. Again, as hammer, it got tenacity. As mole, actually, not just hammer, it's mole. When you miss attack, you're doing your strength damage. And basic damage is already pretty impressive. You get additional attacks, concussive smash that can turn target into dazed state, and when target dazed, they will lose dexterity bonus to their armor. Very nice against high armor targets that got armor from their dexterity. You got bake breaker to make target prone, but also grunt slam action. So every time per short rest you can use this once per fight and you will inflict damage in a large area. It will be bludgeoning and thunder damage. So just look at that. Damage is really insane, while also you get ability to push targets away from you. Next one is not really powerful, but it's really cool looking and it's really easy to miss this weapon. So next weapon is katana, really big katana. And there's only one instance of katana in this game. It got plus 1 enchantment, 1d10 damage, if you wield it in two hands, you can wield it in one hand. Pretty good animations, not samurai-like, but still, it's really funny to kick enemies with katana. You can use lacerate, flourish, and rush attack with it. So nothing special about it, but if you build a ninja character, I guess you will like to have katana on him. Or samurai, whatever you like more. Next sword again, you can find it in Act 3. First of all, it's looking cool for a long sword, but his problem is, of course, there's no good enchantment, so only plus one. And when you just check in damage, possibly you instantly selling this sword. Again, never rush, because it got awesome characteristics. First of all, it's increasing your charisma plus two. So if you're playing someone like Paladin, or maybe Hexblade Warlock, so your damage is really benefiting from your charisma, this sword is really insane because there's no limits on this charisma, so you get up to 22 charisma easily without never ever even using ability point distribution. When you kill an enemy, allies within 9 meters gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier. So again, very nice for Paladin to support your allies or for Hexblade Warlock to again support your allies and give them more sustain in a fight. Enchantment is not great, but Commander Strike action is really insane. By using action and bonus action, your ally can use reaction to inflict damage. So that's very useful if you got allies that's doing more damage than your class. And you really can be kind of supportive class. You can uh, take smaller targets with this sword, like minion triggers, minion gnomes, and other small guys. Every time you kill a target, you're healing your teammates and yourself, and at the same time giving your allies ability to use reaction as extra attack. So that's really powerful sword, never miss this one. And before I show you how to get this awesome scimitar, let's get back to the most powerful weapon in the game. After you enter lower city, you can already get this weapon. It's looking like a normal maze. And most of players can even not hover mouse over it. But when you do so, you will see it's doing additional plus 4d8 radiant damage which is same as level 3 Divine Smite, on every hit, without using spell slots. It's insane. Lots of you guys maybe know how to get it, but for those of you who don't know, you're going to Basilisk Gate in Lower City, then going to the Storm Shower Tabernacle, and you need to get to this ornate wooden hedge. After entering this place, be a little bit careful, there's a lot of traps. But by entering final room, you will see a lot of chests, and all you need to do is to just steal something from this chest. As you can see, I already stole everything, so to demonstrate, I will just put something in the chest and then take it. Now I castigated by divinity. It's curse. Then just get back to your camp, and instead of using 
remove curse, use healing word. It will summon two divas. Just like that. When you summon them nearby of uh, Garab and Yena, they will kind of do nothing or try to kill Cat. He is unkillable, so that's like easiest place where you can be. And then just destroy the divas. It's uh, pretty easy if you leveled up enough. So, they defeated, but there is nothing on them. At least for now. Now we need to do long rest. And after one day is passed, you will see these pouches. In pouches there will be Diva's maze. So just take it, you can dual wield it with uh, right feeds and <laughs> basically do incredible amounts of damage. It got no enchantment, so make sure to have high hit chance with some classes like Oath of Vengeance Paladin and you will be insanely powerful. So how to get Scimitar that I showed you in the beginning? You need to be a cleric with deity of helm, so helm cleric, that's it. Now just do same actions, go to wooden catch, steal something from chest, but now you can't go to camp as far as I know. So just a heal character who is uh, like cursed right now and who is helm cleric in open area in the town and this will summon two genies. Genies is a lot more powerful than divas, so be careful. Versus genies, you need to be really leveled and powerful. And you need to defeat them. They got really high hit points, but with the right builds, you can definitely manage them. But be aware, they got thunder and lightning immunity. After you defeat in genies, they will disappear. Basically disappear. You can't even loot these guys, so how to get this awesome scimitar from them? Actually, the same action, so go and long rest. Then leave your camp, and the <laughs> same as Divas, you will see the pouches. And here we are, Genie Scimitar. 1d6 plus 2d10 poison damage. It got enchantment, so it's easier to hit. And it's light and finesse, so it can be dual wield by any character. You don't need additional feats. Damage is slightly weaker than Divas Maze. And it's poison damage, a lot of targets will have poison immunity. Still, I think it's looking cool, and there's item in the game, Poisoner's Ring, which can make your targets invulnerable to poison damage, which will double this poison damage, and you will be able to hit up to 50 damage with just one hit, without any additional improvements. Of course, you can enhance this damage even more, just by dipping this capture into fire, and by having some rings and other improvements for your weapon. And that's really, really, really a rare item that I never saw before. And I already got a lot of builds with this rare item, so you can watch them on the screen right now. See you in the next videos.